If you have your Bibles this evening, I'm going to ask you to join me in the book of Hebrews and uh, chapter 9, verse 22. That'll be my text, but I will be using quite a bit of scriptures. Most of them will be on the screen, but some I'll just be referring to. And we're going to perhaps journey on a, down a path that's familiar to maybe some or most, but... Um, I just want the Lord to touch our hearts tonight. I want to talk about the blood and the power of the blood. Amen. I love singing those songs that remind me of the redemptive power and the redemptive nature of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. The power of the blood. And so from Genesis all the way throughout Scripture, we can see the application of blood, both literally and in typology. And so I just pray tonight that the hand of the Lord will just touch us. Amen. I, I feel like God has really stirred my heart today. And, uh, and I pray, I've, I've sincerely asked the Lord to just help me get out of me, what I feel like he's put in me today. Amen. God bless you and you can be seated. There is no cleansing agent more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us, the scripture says, from all sin. I'm thankful for the cleansing power of the Lord. The recipients of, of uh, the first epistle of Simon Peter they were no strangers, of course, to the shedding of blood. They were, uh, they were accustomed to that. They knew the language. They knew exactly what Simon Peter was talking about. As a matter of fact, there was probably no other practice more familiar to them. And so when he began to share with them, as he wrote about the blood of Jesus Christ, he established in their heart and in their mind that this was not ordinary blood. And uh, this was not the blood of, of a goat or a calf or this was not the blood of a sheep. But as the song writer said so many years ago, for his blood was not just blood of another spotless lamb, but his blood was precious blood for it washed the sin of man. His blood, it heals my body, it sets my spirit free. And I'm so glad his precious blood still flows from Calvary. Simon Peter was saying that. This is not just ordinary blood. Once Christ has shed his blood for the sins of mankind, there was no need for any further sacrifice because his blood did what no other blood could do. And so if you are by chance making the journey of your bread program this year. I hope we're doing that together uh, in, in some fashion reading through the Bible. And if that's the case, this early on in the year, you're probably reading through the Old Testament and, and uh, you can relate to some of what we're saying here tonight. According to John chapter one and verse 29, his blood took away the sin of the world. Now that's a powerful statement. So when we think about the incarnate Christ giving his own life's blood, it became possible then for the indwelling of the spirit in the soul of humanity. And so I'm thankful tonight for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but John 10 and 10, the, the scripture says that Jesus Christ came that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Not, not just barely, but that we might have abundant life. And it's only through the shed blood of the one that possessed abundant life that he could give that gift of abundant life back to us. And so I want us to consider for just a few minutes this evening the Old and the New Testament. The word testament means covenant or a will, if you please. And we'll be talking about that in just a few more minutes. But the covenant, Old Testament, New Testament, uh, that word testament means covenant. And so it's a, it's a legal document. And as is with the case with all legal documents, the most recent addition of a legal document takes precedence over previous copies. And so 
You can have a will, but you can write another will. And the newer will is going to take precedence over what has been written. And so in the event, uh, in, in the event that there is discrepancies between any document, the latest revision, the latest revisions are considered to be binding to both parties. And so whatever has last been written, that is the binding document. So these revisions would become then, in this case, the legal authority. So we must understand, of course, that there are no discrepancies between the Old and, and New Testament, but there are differences. And so that's what I want to talk about. I want to take my time, and I don't want to rush through anything. I don't, I don't want you to think that we want to be here all night, but I don't want to rush through this because I want us to understand something. That one of the purposes of the book of Hebrews was to point out the differences between the Old and the New Testament. Paul, I, I believe, explained this principle to the church at Rome well. In Romans 8 and 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And so there are people that ascribe to the ideology that the Old Testament is just for another generation and it does not apply to us because the New Testament took its place. Well, the New Testament actually comes along to validate the Old Testament and you can find them everywhere and wholly completely linked. In Matthew 5 and 17, Jesus said, think not, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, but I'm not come to destroy, but I'm come to fulfill the law, amen. And so if you know anything about the law and the Old Testament and the New Testament, we would certainly know that the New Testament does not water down the Old Testament. If anything, the New Testament holds us to a higher standard. I mean, the Old Testament just simply said, do not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But the New Testament said, if you look on someone to lust after them, you've committed adultery in your heart. So it's a fallacy to think that the Old Testament came along to just water down or take away from the Old Testament. The purpose of the Old Testament, I think, are many, and I don't think that I am proposing tonight an exhaustive list, but I'll give you just a few of the purposes of the Old Testament. The Old Testament, for one, gives us a definition of sin. The Old Testament gives us, to some degree, the, a governing agent for sin. I believe that the Old Testament exposes to mankind a true and valid need for grace. And I also believe the Old Testament was a tool that was used, a vehicle that would bring man and Christ together. And so there are many. I'll talk about these few tonight. Romans 7 and 7, the scripture says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? This is what the apostle Paul said. He said, is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. And so Paul is saying then, shall we say that the law is a sinful thing and we should have never had the law and, and we just need to abolish that and do without? And Paul said, absolutely not. Because had it not been for the law, we would not have even known anything about sin. And so it defines sin. It brings us to where we are. So I would submit to you that murder prior to the, the, the commandments, the Ten Commandments, the law, was not a sin because murder had not been defined as a sin. Thou shalt not kill came after actually the first murder in the book of Genesis. In other words, it was the law that exposed sin and it caused mankind to know what was right and what was wrong. Before the law, I would just say it this way, hard to imagine, but before the law, there was no such thing as breaking the law because there was no law. Amen. So the law was to expose or define sin. It was also to govern sin. So by establishing now what is right and what is wrong and by determining the penalties of the guilt of, of the guilty and we see that all throughout the Old Testament, the law could to some degree 
limit the number of transgressions. And so now we have a law and we have now the, the penalty of if you transgress the law, we have the penalty of that. And so it was a governing agent. It helped to some degree. And in truth, that's what the law does today. That's what the laws of our land do. They define sin. The sign that says speed limit 55, it defines sin. Somewhere there's a law written down that gives the penalty if you violate that by this many miles an hour, et cetera, et cetera. To some point, I think you can just be taken straight to jail if you break the law radically enough. Now, the law, that's what the law, it's there to dissuade sin. Now, when the speed limit is 70 and, and we've got our crew set on 75 and then every now and then we've just kind of accidentally bumped up to 80 and somebody comes past you so fast it swerves your car, you realize that it don't work for everybody. <laughs> but it is there to dissuade sin. It's not 100%. But how many can finish this line? Don't do the crime if you... <laughs> oh, you bunch of sinners. Because it just, it just should be don't do the crime because it's wrong. Don't do the crime because it's illegal, it's immoral. Don't do the crime if you just simply think you can't do the time. It means I've thought if I'd get by with this, I'd probably do it. Amen. And so we're going to ask our musicians to come. We're going to come back and pray again. And so it's a law. It, it's there to define. It's there to regulate. It's there to somehow try to, to, uh, to impress upon us that this is what's right. This is what's right. I believe that it also exposes a real need for grace. Of course, the law can only limit lawlessness to a degree. There's no such thing as stamping out. You can't eliminate it, of course. So consequently, man realized that we need something more. We need that rules alone. That's not gonna change the heart of a person, rules alone. And so a, a number of years ago, I don't know how long or when, but uh, you know there was a great campaign about not drinking and driving. And so everybody understands the principle of that. And uh, I hope we do. Understand the principle of not drinking and driving, the dangers of that. But you know, uh, from time to time, uh, I've seen this at schools and different places, we have seen the carnage of an automobile that's been involved in a drunk driving accident. And you see that on display. That's a little sobering, isn't it? That kind of takes the law off the book. That kind of, you know, we, we read that in black and white and we get the principle of it and we go, yeah, we know that. That's, that wouldn't be a good thing. But when you see the carnage, the aftermath of something, then we realize that, that something has to happen to change the heart of a person. And so hopefully that, that idea of looking at the end result, it's to reach for the heart of the matter, to say this can happen to you, this can happen to anyone. So man realized that something more than the law was needed. Humanity was gonna require divine intervention to end the sinful leanings of our nature, that natural bent, because we are born in sin, shaping in iniquity, and so there's a natural bent. So man needs a heart change. That's what has to happen. And, and another reason for the law was, again, to serve as a vehicle, a pathway to lead mankind to Christ. Galatians 3 and 24 says, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And so once sin is defined, then we realize that sin has now got to be governed. And the governing of sin, however, in the governing of sin, there was a real need, a revelation for grace because the law was abrupt. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. The eye was, cr was crude and cruel at times. And aren't you thankful for mercy and grace and understanding? And, and I'm thankful that 
uh, that even in the, law, the laws of our land and our court system, I'm thankful that I know there are some things that are absolutes, but I'm thankful for a judge and a, in some cases a jury that can hear a matter out and look at the whole picture and make a decision based upon that. What you see in that act is not just the law, but you see mercy. You see that the, 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 the room there for grace to move. John 1 and 17 says, for the law was given by Moses, but grace... Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the law, but I'm also thankful for grace to come with that law. Amen. So the new covenant replaced, so to speak, the old covenant by fulfilling its prerequisites. Now, the Old Testament, I just wanna be emphatic here, the Old Testament was given with the intention of ushering in the New Testament. Not one or the other, but it's and it's together. I mentioned Sunday about the prodigal son, and I want, I want to go back there for just a moment. In the parable of the prodigal son, the older brother who stayed home, he complained, if you know the story, he had never received the, you know, the kind of treatment his, his brother goes off, blows his inheritance, finds himself in a, in a pig pen, makes his way back home, and his father sees him coming and just throws the party of all time. And his brother was filled with disdain because he had never had that kind of treatment. He had never felt that kind of welcome. He had, he had never had the party thrown for him, so to speak. But this was the response of the father. And I think it's imperative to understand this principle. The, the, the young man that stayed home said, I've never had anything on this wise. And his father said to him in Luke 15 and 31, he said, thou art ever with me and all that I have is thine. You're missing the point. When the candles are blown out, when the dishes are put away, when everyone returns back to their respective place, everything that I have, you still have. You've been always with me. Amen. And so I, I believe we can say, see a, a principle of that also in Genesis 25 where Abraham, he said he gave all that he had to Isaac. So we see this principle that the Lord is inclusive, putting us in. And those examples serve to illustrate the absolute generosity of God who the scripture says gives freely to his heirs. Amen. I'm, I'm very thankful for, I'm very thankful for generous people in my life. Amen. You ask for one egg, you're gonna get two. You ask for a little, you're gonna get a little bit more because of the spirit of generosity. John 14 and 12 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me the works that I do shall the works that I do shall he do also. And then the scripture says something very, very unusual. And it says, and greater works than these shall he do because I go into my father. And greater works shall he do. Well, that, that could really be perplexing in our mind if we think about that. From the scripture, we know that Jesus did many miraculous things. He opened blinded eyes. He unstopped deaf ears. He cleansed lepers. He stopped funeral processions. He brought the dead back to life again. The lame, he sent home whole and complete. And so how, if, if Jesus did all of that, how could we do, and how could you and I do works that are greater than Christ did? Amen. So how, that's a, I think that's a fair question, but I believe we could begin to answer that question by thinking about another question, and that is what's greater, something that happens in a physical realm or something that happens in a spiritual realm? Because you can have just one eye and make it to heaven. That's a physical thing, but you can't be missing something spiritually and make it to heaven. Amen. I believe the obvious answer, which is greater, a physical in the physical or in the spiritual, we would have to have a resounding yes that we want to operate in the spirit far greater than cleansing the disease of the body would be the act of cleansing sin from a man's heart now it appears to us from scripture that Jesus never baptized anybody in water but we have not only the right but the obligation of baptizing in the pe people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sin and so we're doing a greater work Jesus never personally prayed anybody through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost 
Because John 7 and 39 says, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Yet many that are sitting here tonight and others that will join us online, amen, have had the incredible opportunity of praying somebody through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You didn't give them the Holy Ghost, we know that. But we've been standing right there and our faith connected to their faith and praying and encouraging them. I'm gonna tell you, if you've ever been present when somebody received the Holy Ghost, it's an experience that you will never forget because it doesn't just change the inner man. Instantly, there is a change to the outer man. These are, they're, these are all wonderful things in life, but there is a life to come. I'm thankful for a life to come. If I thought, amen, like the apostle said, that, that this was all there was, that would be of all men most miserable. We know that this world truly is not our home. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of the man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And so we can read about it, we can dream, we can imagine, but I believe that God just has a barrier in our mind, God has a barrier in our dreams. He said, eye hasn't seen, ear hasn't heard, it hasn't even entered into the heart of a man. It's not even been in the thought of a man what God has prepared. Now, I think that's incredible and I just want you to excuse the simplicity of my thinking. But I just am amazed at what man can think to do and pull off. During the holidays, my wife and I were invited to a dinner and it was on one of the Disney properties. And as we rode through that vast acreage, I asked my wife, do you think that Walt Disney ever thought that it would evolve into this? And so it's amazing what man can think to do. When man was building the Tower of Babel, what's the scripture say that they were, they're, going to, they're going to try to accomplish something. And he said, and they're going to pull it off. They're going to do it. And so when you can think of what man can contrive and can, can think of in their heart and pull it off, and the Lord said, I hasn't seen, ear hadn't heard, it hasn't even entered into the heart of a man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. That is something that ought to stir something deep in our heart and soul. Amen. I want to transition just a moment and talk from Hebrews 9 and 16 and and uh, the Bible says here, it, it says, for where a testament is, there must also, there must also of necessity be the, the death of the testator. Now, that, that's a, an unusual word, but for where there is, where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is, is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So if we could just change that word there from testament to will, perhaps we would understand that language a little bit more in the day that we live. And so for the will, and I'm gonna go back and say that, for where a will is, there must also be of necessity the death of the person that wrote the will. For the will is of force after men are dead, otherwise it is, it is of no strength while the person that wrote the will still lives. It's just a piece of paper. And so my wife and I, and many I'm sure in this building, have a will and our son and daughter-in-law knows where our will is. We sat down with them, read over it. They know everything that's going to happen. But right now, it's just a piece of paper. Because of this. You ready? I'm still here. And so it's just a piece of paper. It's recorded. It's in the courthouse. But it means nothing because the testator, it means nothing. <laughs> because the testator, I've had to look that way several times, haven't I, lately? It means nothing because the testator is still living. The will has no effect because the maker of the will must die. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Amen. That's what the scripture is talking about. And so if you've experienced and ever been the recipient of a will, you know what I'm talking about. 
The new covenant only became, the New Testament only became effective after the death of Jesus Christ because the testator had to die. Amen. This is significant. What I'm talking about is significant tonight, not because of me, but I want you to hear me. It is significant to individuals because people must understand that Bible characters like Abraham and Moses and John the Baptist and even the thief on the cross, they cannot be compared to the heirs of the new covenant. We cannot compare the heirs of the new covenant because that all happened when the testator was still alive. Amen. So the will was not valid until after the death of Jesus Christ. And so they were not required to meet the criteria that was set forth by Jesus Christ. So when we think about uh, the instructions that the Lord gave to Nicodemus, for example, he commanded, he said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God, John 3, 5. Jesus was speaking to those who would be partakers of the new covenant, amen. But the message of the gospel was not complete until the death, and in this case, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There had to be the death, burial, and the resurrection. That's what enacted the will. Am I making any sense? Amen. So in truth, the understanding of the disciples themselves was not even clear until after the resurrection. They were befuddled. They were bewildered. They understood the message to a degree that three days I will rise again as Jonah was in the belly of the well and, and, and on and on. They got it. But even Jesus walked among them after he was resurrected and they didn't understand it. They didn't realize that he was with them until he revealed himself. Amen. But after the resurrection... Peter preached his first sermon on the day of Pentecost and it was that Christ in him, the hope of glory. In this sermon, he gave a faith response to the message of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And so obedient faith, obedient faith requires repentance, water baptism, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. This was the birth of the New Testament church and that is the message of salvation for you and I today. And so when people ask you about these characters and those characters in scripture, we got to remember that the testator had to die in order for the will to be enacted. When we think about remission through the blood, I'll get back to my subject here this evening. The tabernacle in the old covenant uh, was stained with blood sacrifices and, and the sacrifices of, of animals on and on. Blood was shed everywhere. The brazen altar, it was a brazen labor where the priests would wash the blood from, from themselves after the sacrifices and blood was then sprinkled on articles of furniture throughout. It was offered on the mercy seat and the holies of holies. And so we see the blood, that typology. In like manner, the blood of Jesus Christ is not just applied to our lives one time. I think it's imperative that we understand this. Amen. Rather, through throughout a Christian's experience with God, that blood cleanses and that blood covers again and again and again. I'm gonna tell you, don't just go to the altar one time and think this is sufficient. You know, on such and such date at such and such time in this complete setting, I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and think that we got a one-time dose, a one-time touch. But John chapter one and verse number seven says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanseth us. Amen. ETH, it continues to cleanse us from all sin. Hallelujah. I'm thankful that he cleansed me Sunday. But I'm even more thankful that he cleansed me Monday and he cleansed me yesterday and he cleansed me today because I'm gonna walk in the light as he is in the light. And as I walk with him, his blood continues to wash and continues to cleanse Amen. Here is the act. Here is the act of cleansing by the blood of Jesus Christ in a continuous fashion. Being cleansed by sin of the blood of Christ is predicated upon one thing, and that is walking in the light. You've got to walk in the light that you have. Somebody says, well, I don't understand everything there is to understand. I hadn't quite got it all together yet. I want to encourage you. Walk in the light that you have. Amen. Just walk in the light you have. You say, well, I don't see this, and I don't understand that. I don't know why we do this don't know why we do that. Just walk in the light. And as you walk in the knowledge that you have, amen, the spirit will continue to cleanse and wash and work with you 
Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, no matter where you see someone tonight, this is not where they started. This is not where their journey began. They just kept walking with God. They just kept walking in the light. And when they fell down, they got up. And when they messed up, they straightened up. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of God just continued to cleanse and wash. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Before he ascended, Jesus commanded his disciples to preach repentance and remission. Luke 24 says, repentance and remission of sins in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And that's exactly what began on the day of Pentecost. Peter was not only preaching in Acts 2.38, but he also commanded the spirit filled Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 to be baptized. And you can see it again and again throughout the book of Acts. Furthermore, in his first epistle, Peter wrote that baptism does also now save us. Amen, I'm thankful for the blood. From the beginning of time, God established the principle of shedding of blood to provide a covering of sin. When Adam and Eve, so let's go all the way back to Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they tried to cover their nakedness first with what? They took fig leaves, sewed them together, and they tried to cover up their ill, their wrong. They tried to cover up their nakedness, but God rejected those garments, and he had a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice. Blood was shed. Skin was given to cover them. As God prepared for the tenth and the final plague upon Egypt, he instructed his people on how they would escape the coming tragedy. He told them their salvation is going to come through the blood, and we read it in Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 7. God commanded the Israelites to take the blood and to strike it on the two doorposts and over the top of the door. Amen. He said, now, if you will do that, this plague will not strike you. Hallelujah. And when I see the blood, you remember that? When I see the blood, when you have the blood applied to the doorpost, we, somebody said, well, that doesn't make any sense. What I'm going to tell you, even to the person that said, you know, I'm not really sure why we're doing this, but we're just going to do this out of obedience to the Lord. But the Lord said, when I see the blood, blood I will pass over you and even to those that didn't understand I'm going to tell you the next morning at daylight they were very thankful that they had applied the blood to their lives because the death angel passed over their house the apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 called the Lord Jesus Christ our Passover and so the Passover in Egypt was the perfect type if you please, of Jesus Christ. First, the sacrifice in Egypt was a young lamb without blemish. The second lamb had to be slain in Exodus 12. Jesus was the lamb that was slain according to Revelation 13 and 8. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. John the Baptist called him in John 1 29 when he was baptized and the, 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 the dove began to set down on him. Amen. John pointed to him and said, behold, that word means turn aside and see or stop and look. He said, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Praise the Lord. Third, the blood sacrifice had to be applied. You have to apply. Amen. You got to obey the truth. You not just know the truth. There's a lot of people that know the truth. I would submit to you tonight there are people that will tell you in a moment that I'm not living right and if the Lord comes tonight, I'm not going to make heaven. But they would defend what they understand of Scripture. It's not enough to know the truth. We've got to obey the truth. <laughs> I'll go back to the lawman and, 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 the, and the speed limit. Sometimes we're pulled over and they walk up to the window and say, you have any idea why I'm stopping you? Mm-hmm. Got a real good idea. <laughs> Any particular reason you're in a hurry? So he didn't just say, because you know the truth. Have a good day. I haven't got a recent speeding ticket. That's not why I'm talking about this, but uh, and I hope I'm not talking myself into one. <clears throat> But it wasn't enough to know the truth. Do you know what the speed limit is? Yes. That's not enough. Then you should have obeyed it. I was with someone one time, grossly speeding, and they thought, well, we'll just talk our way right out of this. Highway Patrol walked up the window. 
Do you have any idea why I'm... Yes, sir. Is there a reason? Yes. Oh, yeah. And he started talking about all the reasons and how big of a hurry he was in. And the man, he had his license in his hand and the highway patrol just reached out with those two fingers and pulled his license from me. He said, I'll try not to keep you too long. Because <laughs> he said, it wasn't enough to know. It wasn't enough to know. You got to obey. <laughs> Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. <laughs> Fourth was the feast of the unleavened bread, which is accompanied by the Passover, and this typified Christ. And, and I, I'm going to ask our musicians if you would come. After leaving Egypt, God commanded His people to continue the shedding of, to continue the practice of shedding blood as a means of redemption. And today, not to belabor the issue, but we even participate in communion, which we did just a few services ago, to commemorate, to remember that she had blood. Once a year in the Old Testament, the high priest entered the holies of holy and offered blood for an atonement for the sins of Israel. And when Christ ascended into heaven, we, we read in Hebrews 9 and 12, he by his own blood, I, I think it's important to hear this, entered once, once, into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So I'm going to go back and say what I said a moment ago. In the Old Testament, the priests went annually, annually, into the holies of holy, offering a blood atonement for the sins of Israel. But when Christ ascended, the writer of Hebrews said that he entered once into that holy place. And we're going to seal this. Hundreds of thousands of animals had given their lives under the old covenant, but Christ was once offered, Hebrews 9 and 28 says, once offered to bear the sins of many. The songwriter well expressed the work of God's redemption when he said this, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There's no cleansing agent. This is where I began. There is no cleansing agent on earth that can take away, a, a, take a sin-scarred, blackened heart and wash it white as snow. We can't sing that into a person, and I say that with great deference to every singer, songwriter, musician in the world. We can't administrate that into the life of a person. You can't. There's nothing but the blood. It's just the blood. I'm going to ask you to stand. Only the blood of a lamb can purge a man's heart and soul. And so speaking through the, what I imagine the baritone voice of Isaiah, God pled with mankind. Isaiah 1 and 18 Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The Lord said, come, let's reason together. Let's reason together. The power of the blood that can cleanse us and wash us. Oh, Thank you, Lord. Amen. I wonder if we could just slip our hands heavenward. Would you